Thank you all so much for sharing your Saturday with us. I'm Maxine Proctor, the managing editor of Blacklash. I'm joining you from beautiful sunny Saskatoon, which is located on Treaty 6 land and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Today we are celebrating the launch of our spring issue, which features an incredible roster of artists and writers, including Erica De Freitas, Taryn Dahad, Jesse Ray Short, Laura St. Pierre, Jacqueline Nguyen, Yvinka Medina, Timothy Yannick Hunter, Liza Kiriko, Derek Colomb, Henry Heng Liu, Christopher Lacroix, Nicole Leroy, Lodo Laura, and of course, Rhiannon Vogel and Chrisanne Stathakos, who are joining me today. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of the issues contributors, the Buffalo Berry Press Board of Directors, our wonderful editorial committee. And lastly, I would like to thank SASC Arts and Canada Council for the Arts for their generous support. Today, Rhiannon will embark on a conversation with Chrisanne about her formidable career and art making practice as it relates to the various technologies of intuition. Rhiannon Vogel lives and studies in Toronto, where she's an active member of the visual arts and endurance running communities. Rhiannon has written for Bomas, Canadian Art, Border Crossings, and Fiden Press. Chrisanne Stathakos is a multidisciplinary artist of Greek, American, and Canadian origin. Her work has encompassed printmaking, textiles, painting, installation, and conceptual art. Chrisanne is heavily involved with and influenced by feminism, Greek mythology, Eastern spirituality, and Tibetan Buddhism, all of which inform her current artistic practice. Thank you so much for your patience, and I will now pass the mic to Rhiannon and Chrisanne. And I will hide myself now. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, Chrisanne and I are joining you um, from the city of Toronto, which is the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Um, it is the meeting place and home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we would like to acknowledge um, our um, presence here on this land. Um, today, Chrisanne and I are going to kind of expand on and talk around um, the article that I wrote for the Black Flash uh, spring issue. Um, and just kind of, you know, casually discuss um, the way that Chrisanne has developed her practice, um, working through um, various um, concepts and ideas around um, the tarot, communication, um, uh, kundalini, uh, ecofeminism, and really her place in um, a really important story and history of Canadian art um, and uh, the Toronto artscape as well. So I'm just going to share my screen here. We have some images to look at. Um, so in case you haven't seen it already, um, this is the, the issue of Black Flash that we're so excited to be launching today. Um, and I think I'd like to start with this image, Chris Ann, when you're ready. Um, Chris Ann and I first encountered one another actually within the 1900 Mirror Mirror installation um, which I talk about in the article last year. And since then, she and I have um, struck up a really uh, a fabulous friendship together. And I've really enjoyed connecting with her and learning more about her practice, where she came from, and again, her role in um, contemporary Canadian art. So, Chrisanne, if you could talk to us a little bit about um, what's happening here in this picture and maybe um, what events transpired that brought okay. to this picture being taken? I'd be happy to. So this photograph was taken at the Cleveland Institute of Art, but I should say um, my family, my grandparents uh, immigrated to Canada in the 19, early 1920s, probably after the exchange <laughs> of populations. 
my mother's family and she was born in Toronto. And then my father's family uh, around 1900 immigrated to Niagara Falls and were constantly going between Niagara Falls, New York and Ni Niagara Falls, Ontario to give some broader perspective. And uh, this, my first year of art school was at the Cleveland Institute of Art. It was during the time of uh, Vietnam and the protests. And this photograph was taken of me as first year art student by Wolfgang Zimmerman. Um, shortly before the protests on the campus, uh, the same time that Kent State happened. So I was protesting along with everybody else when Kentstead happened, the campus was about 30 miles away and the horses came on and everyone found out about the shooting. And at that point I thought, there were a lot of my friends who were draft dodgers and I thought, I'm, I'm just gonna go to Toronto and I'll go to art school there. So, um, so by 1970, 71, I was in Toronto and I started at York University right at the beginning of the program. And when I, the first time I went into the printmaking studio, it was empty. But my teacher came, Eugenio Telez, who was, um, had worked at Stanley Hayter's Atelier 17. And I thought, where were the presses? <laughs> you know? But at that time, what was really wonderful about York, and if you talk to anyone who was at the beginning of York, they had such a diverse faculty. So many different people were coming in from all around the world. And being the start of the program there, it was unbelievably creative moment. And what did you study when you were there? Pardon? What did you study? At your uh, I studied fine art. I majored in printmaking, painting. I attended art history, South Asian art. I took a gamelan class with the, which I almost failed. I'm not good on gamelons. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and uh, friends, David Buchan was there. Uh, Jane Byers, Liz Ingram, you know, and a number of people who've made very important contributions to Canadian, Canadian, the Canadian art scene. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps okay. you could talk a little bit about um, okay. how, you, yeah. how you got involved um, after art school in a very specific type of um, a okay. specific group of Toronto artists. Okay. Um, after art school, for a moment, I went to Vancouver and was involved with a group called Pure Group Mural Company. And I attended different talks at the and performances at the Western Front with Hank Bull, Kate Craig, and we painted murals. And then I met uh, Martin Heath, who became my partner. And then I went moved back to Toronto. And eventually we started a number of spaces together where we lived, you know, 466 Bathurst Street, The Gap, which had um, multiple performance capabilities. And um, Martin had his cinema, which he still has in Toronto, I believe. And, and so that was the beginning of that. I was very lucky when I first lived in Toronto. I lived in a small neighborhood, uh, Bay and Davenport, and I was surrounded by mostly theater people and some ballet people. And um, my roommate, Diane Roblin, who's a wonderful musician and very well known in the Toronto area currently, um, took me to a studio. She said, come with me one day. This would have been 1972. And she took me to a studio, a loft on Young Street. And that was the loft of general ideas. So that's when I first met AA. And, um, he, and she also took me to the Miss General Idea pageant, which was at the AGO. And so I had glimpses of the the history of 
you know, moments that are very revered in terms of Canadian art. And um, having been born in Buffalo, I curated a show of Toronto artists who went to Hall Walls, and I'm still involved with Hall Walls somewhat. And Hall Walls was a nonprofit artist space, which for, you know, Cindy Sherman, Robert Longo, and Charlie Clough, and many important artists came out of that. Anyways, after that, I approached A Space, and Peggy Gale was the director of A Space at that time, about doing a public art project in a, in a building that was going to be destroyed. And this was the Clock Tower building, which was at Bathurst and King. And they, um, and the show, we couldn't go inside the building. We had to be outside the building. So the artists that were in the exhibition were General Idea, Ray Johnson, Paul Campbell, Wendy Knox Lead, and myself. And I made a banner hanging from the clock tower and General Idea um, did, did Toronto's Fault, the, the first tremors, ruins of the Silver Bar Lounge from the 1984 Miss General Idea Pavilion. I, I believe you have the text to do. Yeah, so A sent this text for everyone to see. And I, I guess I could read it. Sure. Um, you know, uh, was Toronto's fault was perhaps the earliest of general ideas archaeological installations. Using the ruins at the back of Terminal Building, we took all the artifacts we found there, bits of architectural detail, pipes, slabs of concrete, and painted them silver, placing them back amidst debris. The result was a kind of scatter piece of found elements. Like many of General Idea's best works, it was a site-specific temporary installation. It led to better known ruins of Chroma Key Club, the blue ruins from the 1984 Miss General Idea Pavilion presented in Holland in 1983, also a temporal installation. So um, over the years, um, um, oh, do you want to talk about the, no. the banquet, the one after that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can go ahead. I just advanced by accident. Um, but I guess I, I think what's really interesting about um, that particular exhibition and your involvement in it as well is that not only were you an artist at that point, but you were you were also involved in in curating in a way that event and organizing that event and between the Hall Walls events and the events at A-Space and then the terminal building, um, you were quite influential in really bringing a lot of these artists and um, and and thinkers yeah. and makers together well, it, in one space. It, you know, I have to say it wasn't unusual at that time for artists to be doing that. Our rents were not high. Uh, for after Martin and I moved to Bathurst Street, pretty much uh, those years in Toronto, uh, part of our loft was a public space mm -hmm. where people had, Oliver Gerling had a show at our space. There, we worked with different um, artist groups. We had Kathy Acker speak at one of our spaces. So it, Michael Smith performed at The Gap. So it was, along with Martin doing CineCycle movies there. So that went on for, I really didn't have a private space um, all those years. And um, sometimes we had, would have visitors from the police wondering what we were doing. And um, one time a police officer said, the criminals come out after 9 p.m. I thought that was a little early. <laughs> and, and um, but it was a very open time. Chromosome started. There was just very active within that. So, um, and at the same time, I was working as a, to as an artist educator. So I worked with Inner City Angels. I traveled to all parts of Toronto to do special projects with children. And I was active on many, many, many different fronts um, and then decided 
to go to New York. And what and what happened there? Uh, I went to New York. I immediately got a show at Frida, so Art Overn was in a show at the Drawing Center. And then I was like, as usual story with New York, then I had a great loft in Greenpoint. But at uh, one point I got very sick. They never figured it out. But I believe it was because we were on top of the water, which was polluted. I believe it was I had um, got something that was environmental. And at one point, a friend said, oh, there's a tiny apartment in Little Italy. It's $250 a month. I said, I'm there. So, and then I moved into a tiny, 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 tiny apartment with the bathtub in the kitchen, whole tenement building, but it allowed me to pursue, you know, my work and have a separate studio. And um, I became involved with the Lower East Side Print Shop, and which was very involved with many, many different diverse groups and minority artists and doing posters. And um, by the end of the 1980s, um, A.A. and Jorge of General Idea, and I got a studio at 14th Street and 9th Avenue. Uh, they had come to New York and it was, it's now the Apple store <laughs> and many great artists were in that building. Uh, Peter Schiff, Katie Nolan, many people. And, um, you know, I entered into a number of collaborations with different artists, uh, the abortion project with Kathy Burkhart, the banquet with Hunter Reynolds. And this is an image from the banquet with me in one of our, my hairdressers. And it's at the Robert Schiffler Foundation who, who bought the installation. So this, this image is from around 1995. Um, around I'm the same time, a little, the banquet happened the year before 1900 Mirror Mirror, which, you know, and at this point we, AIDS was, uh, AIDS was, uh, like in our lives, you know, our friends were getting ill, they were dying, our colleagues. And um, so that informed my practice and my work and broke my heart at the same time. Yeah. Um, I just have a, I have a question for our audience quickly. If someone can let me know um, if they are actually seeing the images on the screen, um that is something i've been alerted to might not be um working okay people can see them great okay thank you um chris and i wanted to go back to and 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 um just back up to this image um ensuring that everyone has seen it uh, but also talk just a little bit about what you were just mentioning this idea of um the doubling of printmaking with the idea of um, things starting to be becoming a very urgent time for you in a very um, tumultuous time as far as the AIDS pandemic beginning and um, a lot of your friends being intimately affected by that. And how did that affect kind of the work that you were, were making at that moment? Well, a lot of the work um, there, there were two ways people approached it, I think. One was very political, act up. There was whack and um, very, very political work. And then there was work which dealt with the body. Mm -hmm. And some, and a lot of times they, they were intermingled, mm -hmm. both with the body and the politics, probably most of the time. And so the banquet was a staged performance and Hunter Reynolds, uh, his alter ego was Patina Dupre. And I made a series of hairdresses and we inverted Merritt Oppenheim Spring Feast where they ate, oh, she had a dinner on, on a woman's body. The woman was alive, no one was dead probably. <laughs> and so we, I thought, well, in terms of Greek mythology, it should be the goddess, the women eating off the men. 
So we inverted it and we showed it first at Thread Waxing Space. We had, I don't know, 500 people. It was on May 1st, May Day, the Beltane. And uh, the people around the table, the women around the table were Ann Pasternak, Kathy Burkhardt, Ellen Saul Peter, Susan Silas, Sina Lardari, um, my dear friend Janet Edmondson, who passed away two years ago, and myself. So it was a very important moment. And it dealt with, and my printmaking was the printed hair on the dresses, the etching on the table of, I did an imprint of the young man's body. Yes, he laid down and Hunter had a huge ball gown. And so it was a very multifaceted piece. And was the, what was the idea behind the banquet? What, what happened during the performance? Hunter, uh, it started off with Hunter uh, on a podium circling, motorized. Uh, with music, I think you, Diamanda Glalis. And then the, the, we were sitting around the table with the food, which was on uh, the young man's body. And as we, we acted as the menads from Delphi and Dionysus, and we drank and we ate a lot of chocolate, a lot of strawberries and a little meat for some. And, and then everyone read a text. I read from the Bacchae, Kathy read one of her stories, and Pasternak read from a political piece on racism, and Susan Silas read from Story of O, and Janet read from Iana, the theme of Iana. And was it also, um, was it also, the this ceremony was it also um kind of a memorial as well no it was a bacchanalia so both a, a memorial <laughs> um so yeah. uh, after um you made this work i think i'll skip ahead to 1 900 um and we can come back to the mandalas after mm -hmm. um but you alluded before to how um, 1900 and a lot of your work at this time was being um, directly influenced by the AIDS pandemic. And um, I, I was hoping you could tell the audience a little bit about how this particular piece um, first came to life. And then we can look at it in the context well, that uh, we saw it here in Toronto recently. Yeah. I was very interested in the idea of infinity mir mirrors, but I have to say, you know, I, uh, a good part of my growing up was in Buffalo and um, I grew up with the Albright Knox Art Gallery mm -hmm. and I was very familiar with Lucas Samaras' work, not Kasama, and his mirrored room there. And not that this was a uh, copying, but in the time of the AIDS pandemic and the different mythological texts I was studying, Buddhist and spiritual texts, I, I, the idea came to me like the idea of an infinity mirrored infinity, coupled with the fact that I had met uh, Frank Andrews who lived on my street who was a famous psychic to the stars. He read for Princess Grace, John Lennon and Yoko, and Andy, Andy Warhol did a portrait of him. And so I took tarot lessons from Frank and he's still a very good friend. And so I sort of coupled it into this installation, like the idea of the phone where you would get reading. I, I did sign up for one of the 1-900 companies that you could call and get a reading. And I did that for a month and then that was way too much. People were so um, desperate for like, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do this? So, but I, but I, I learned how to do it on the phone. So you, and then I found the, 
I found a, vin a video phone and I, I thought, well, that would be interesting. So somehow all the elements came together in 1900 Mirror Mirror to do a mirror room. But it, I met with the architect, Ken Saylor, who said, let's open up the telephone booth. So it's a booth, it's a, it's a project where the, the telephone booth is open up. And, but there's an infinity aspect. So people could call me, that's me, uh, you know, that's me in the little Italy apartment with the, with the video phone. I have to say that the photographs here are by photographer and artist Maxine Henrinson, who is also one of the participants, uh, you know, members of AIR right now. And um, so Maxine followed the project photographing it, which I'm deeply thankful for after all these years. And so one would sit in the booth and one would see themselves in infinity. And then I would read the cards. Here you see A.A. Bronson and he's in his mirrored bathroom at that time in Toronto at the Colonnade. And this would have been, um, uh, the 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 mirrored room went to Art Metropole in 1995, uh, a, a year and a half after Jorge and Felix passed away of general idea. And the other gentleman is Frank Andrews, my friend who's a psychic, who's actually in the mirrored room giving me a reading. <laughs> and you can see me on the video monitor. Just, uh, there's there I am. And so the, the experience that you would give for those who haven't experienced the installation is that um, originally when it was first shown that it was a mirrored box with two open sides yeah. and mirrors hung on the wall parallel. Yeah, this was at Andrea Rosen. So it was specifically, there were, it, there are four panels. So it changes depending on the installation. So this was specifically done for that space. This was her back room. And what's what tell the viewers what's on the glass, what's printed on the on the mirror? Uh, the, the glass has printed roses on it, printed hair, printed ivy, which are some of my basic materials that I use in terms of pr direct printing still to today. I've always used them. And there's an there's another shot. Um, I like this one um, on the right where you can really kind of see the yeah the this hair shot part, the is hair. with um, at Art Metropole okay and with the Japanese curator and my friend Fern Bear brought him so we were able to take the beautiful and Maxine took the photograph and the other one is from Little Italy with me with the video phone. The interesting thing besides all the how it connects to AIDS and loss and what you would experience at death, which was the idea of the infinity room. Like if you were in an infinity chamber, would it change what your question would be when I'd say, do you have a question for the future? But the other aspect of it is that the piece itself foretold the future mm -hmm. of all of us on our phones, of social chat, of all that. When this piece was made, we didn't have any of that. We didn't even have cell phones. So the piece itself is an oracle, was an oracle. I, I completely agree. And um, there's just a few more close-ups. Yes. Um, so what kind of this is my friend Frank Wagner and Ju Julie Alt at Andrea Rosen. And then again, this is another image of a participant at, from Andrea Rosen Gallery 1900. And so what and Frank, Frank, Frank was a pivotal, uh, he passed away a few years ago, a pivotal curator who did a lot of exhibitions on AIDS and I participated in a show, AIDS World, which was at the Center d'Art Contemporain in Geneva. And he was based in Berlin and very good friend to many, many, many artists. And so what kind of questions would you, would you get from participants? Were there particular what? questions that, that were more prevalent um, in the beginning or? 
No, the questions, I mean, um, I have a log with the questions. So usually I sometimes they wouldn't ask questions and I just pull the card and start talking. That oh. happened often. Sometimes it would be, should I move my apartment? Should I break up? You know, someone said, should I break up with my boyfriend? I would I'd say, I'm not gonna tell you to break up with your boyfriend. <laughs> Um, tell me a little bit about the tarot deck that you used and use. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Tell me a little bit about the tarot deck that you use. Well, the tarot deck I used was a very old Marseille deck. But for the, the show at uh, Cooper Cole, because this past year, the piece came back to Canada in, in the midst of another pandemic. So once you know one has to understand i the piece was in storage for many years and then a number of years ago i started working with the breeder gallery and they said let's we want to show it a freeze so i brought it out of storage it had to be reconfigured and restabilized to show publicly and then we showed it a freeze and it got a lot of press and then it went back into storage. And then Jacob uh, Kravinsky curated a show at Cooper Cole called There Are More Than Four. And I went to New York last March, got the piece out of storage, and we brought it to Toronto. And then COVID happened. Mm -hmm. So it became part of another pandemic, you know. And, um, and the artists in the show were uh, Andy Fabo, who's making fabulous work right now. Uh, Tim Jocelyn, who is a wonderful artist and designer, who is Andy's partner, and Robert Flack. And there's a fabulous show of Rob's up now at Paul Petro for anyone in Toronto. And Rob was very, very good friends. And Rob and I would do various rituals on, um, uh, we do a lot of rituals on my studio roof and various things. And so I decided in honor of Rob that I would um, use the Dikini, the Tantric Dikini tarot deck. And, um, and this is what he always used. And so you have told me the story of you were actually in New York preparing this work to come to Cooper Cole in March of 2020, when things were starting to get more than a little bit scary and you had decided to go regardless. Um, and Cooper Cole had actually asked you to bring this particular work back before we really understood what was going on in the world. Um, and when the exhibition that Jacob curated was installed, it didn't open to the public as it was intended. It came, this work was, um, this work, you know, that ostensibly had you on a video phone telling people's futures and reading tarot decks in an infinity room, came to Canada and was not seen for months. It was on view, um, but was not ever, you know, publicly or, or um, seen in person by the public for a number of months. Um, but you guys came up with a really, um, an interesting way of handling that. And that's how you and I first met, was that you would host Zoom tarot readings and meditations um, yes, we did a number of those. Once and we had, yeah. I asked different people to participate. Um, Scott Trevelyan, uh, Jennifer Fisher, and Jim Drubnak. And, you know, and then we had our poets group. One time we did poetry with Wanda, Bohana, Stephen Andrews, and myself. And, um, and Andy Fable did one. So it was, it was, it was sort of very similar to the video phone as close as you could get, maybe. But you had a large group of people like we have now watching. So oh, 
I mean, it, it, it shocks me still. It kind of gives me shivers the way that this piece really, as you say, kind of foretold and is its own, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a place in a machine for fortune telling, but it told its own future and it told a future that we are actually living in right now. And that idea of yeah. the bubble or the distancing and the six feet away that you would go into your own container to have a conversation with another person on a video screen yeah. um, is just so prophetic and yeah. synergic and coincidental that, you know, it, it's, it's still shocking to me how it all just our entire lives now coalesce in, in almost kind of what we mm -hmm. see here on the screen. Yes. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's an interesting piece. I was asked by a curator, um, you know, uh, in terms of it being, finding a permanent home, you know, uh, how will the piece function if you're not around? Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, if I'm dead, and of course it can function if I'm not around. So, um, you know, whoever's on the other side would have the conversation and would have some knowledge. And, and what we have right now, are a lot of people who are interested in um, the tarot. One thing I should back up and say, when this piece was first conceived, the idea of spirituality within the art world in New York was for many, many people a big no-no. And you couldn't even say you were doing that. But even, but that never stopped my investigations or my interest in it. And a number of years ago, when I went to the LA Book Fair with Printed Matter, with um, our blog Money, Mommy, which I have a Susan Silas, wonderful artist, and I went to this vast room and there were all these young artists doing tarot readings and doing all sorts of things. And I thought they're my children, <laughs> you know? So it was like, I thought it's, uh, and one, one curator said to me, you've been doing this forever and now everyone's catching up to you. I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would have been very radical at the time doing it in a kind of, yeah. It's very, very, you know, theory heavy, postmodern kind of time, still kind of like re- well, even, even though I was connected with Hall Walls, I wasn't, my work did not encompass what that interest was with that Metro Pictures mm -hmm. group. So that was not my, my interest in, in art making. And you've sustained that though through throughout your career. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to leave us a little bit more time. Oh, um, of course, I had to throw in these pictures. Um, this is actually the first time that I saw the work at Cooper Cole, which is um, in June 2020, um, almost a year ago, which is crazy thinking that yeah. um, we had to wear a mask for five minutes. Um, and this, I think, is just, again, this comparison. So at Cooper Cole um, last year, you actually, instead of having the video phone, um, hooked it up, um, had people call on their iPhones. Yeah. The um, video phone, very difficult because it needs a landline and it's somewhat obsolete. It never took on, you know? <laughs> you know, they invented yeah. it, but it never became like... <laughs> A big thing. It's a kind of a time um, capsule in that way too. Yeah, yeah. But but it provided me with the concept that something can live on in, in a way. And and there are people who remember uh, attending in 1993. And in terms of going forward, you know, like you mentioned, you know, when I went to New York to get the piece, I even though I was careful and the virus was there, I was also attending my friend uh, Peter Negi's exhibition of his work from the 80s at Jeffrey Deitch and, you know, and going to storage wasn't, I changed all my plans to come back to New York. I mean, to come back to Toronto early 
because the squirrels attacked my roof and my house. So that was another oracle of itself. So it brought you home earlier, which was yes, probably yeah. a good thing in the yeah. end. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have a little bit of time left, and I wanted to talk about your most recent project. Um, I flipped very quickly through um, an earlier installation at Cooper Cole that um, is part of your Rose Mandela series. Yes, this um, was the, the Rose Mandela at Cooper Cole, and it was part of the exhibition Gold Rush, and this is called the Chemical Rose Mandela. And for this exhibition, I was also using uh, marijuana leaves inside the glass and the paintings you see surrounding it were imprinted marijuana leaves. Luckily, I have friends who still grow it, who gave me the leaves to use. And it referred to earlier paintings, which from the 90s again, with the marijuana leaves, which um, Jorge Santo had, and AA had a garden in their backyard. And, Jorge would give me leaves of plants he was using, the ivy that I used for the 1900, and then some of the marijuana leaves for the paintings. And so this sort of actually has another reference back to that time period. Um, and at the end, I blew away the, uh, the Mandela in a performance. Can you say a little bit about the, the role that the Mandela plays in your work in general and where that where that um, idea came from and what you- The mayor? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are various ways of looking at the mirror. You know, like if you're looking at the mirror in terms of narcissus, where all you do is see yourself or you, all you want to do is see your own image. Uh, there can be like unique ways of like analyzing that. But I'm more interested in the, the idea of the mirror of something going beyond that. Mm. Uh, you know, in terms of Buddhist metaphors, there's a lot of analogies to the mirror, but that mirror also has to do with some form of enlightenment, of expansion of the mind, of going beyond into a sort of universal emptiness, like when you look at the sky or you see a reflection in a lake. So it becomes this whole thing about the universe rather than just yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of some of my Buddhist teachers, they always say to have compassion, you have to start with yourself. So of course you might start with the mirror if you see a child looking at their, themselves for the first time in the mirror, or even a small animal going, wow. But she can, it can go beyond a certain point where the mirror becomes sort of a portal to the universe, which is how I like to use, use it in my work. I can listen to you talk about mirrors all day. <laughs> um, yeah. And We'll just fast forward, fast forward to the present. Um, so this is more details of the piece. Yeah. Um, this is your most recent installation. Yeah. Um, now, yeah, th this is the installation from the 13th Guangzhou Biennial, uh, Minds Rising, Spirits tur Turning, which was curated by director Stephanie Ayas and Natasha Ganwala. And I worked with my wonderful curator, Michelangelo. And, and this was installed at the National Guangzhou National Museum in the chapter of the biennial called The Undead from Four Directions. And the title of this speech is The Three Dakini Mirrors of the Body, Speech, and Mind. Now, in terms of Buddhist practice, you know, body, speech, and mind is very important. Dakinis are female spirits that you see always de depicted in many tankas, and they are quite, they're floating, and they are very energetic, they're very powerful. So I wanted to use that 
um, they're, they're evocative of the movement of the sky and space, but also within this installation is the tripod in the yellow construction mandala. And that is the tripod from the Delphic Oracle. So part of this piece combines not only Greek mythology or Tibetan mythology or practice, it, it combines both of them. It's a multi-layered piece. And it's meant to be, it's, it's situated on cloth, hand-printed cloth with the hair. And then the flowers are placed, the mares are placed and the Bodhi leaves. And then this is the, the, the red mandala of this speech. So each colored mare refers to three energies. The blue energy is the blue space or sky and the source of all action of the body. And then the red is the red energy of the speech, of expression. And then the gold one is the energy of the mind, the source of all thought. So there's a seashell on the red for symbolizing the speech. There's a mati, a blue mati on the blue one, symbolizing the energy and action. And then there's the tripod, the Delphic tripod on the, on the gold one. Yeah. So what was interesting to me, looking back, I was thinking about this today, is that in the past three years, I, I've lost three people very close to me. Um, my brother and two of my closest, dearest friends, uh, Janet and Amy. And that this part, this part of the, the, the biennial, the undead from four directions, as I'm going to read what the directors wrote, because I can't say it better than they did. A dialogue with conceptions of death reparation of spirit ob objects and processes of mourning unveiled at the Guangzhou National Museum. From an ephemeral aura of a flower mandala to the loneliness of a desert necropolis, artistic and historical works will be attuned to linkages of ancestry, visions of the afterlife, non-Western mappings of ailment and cure, and the foundational role of the undead in shaping the registers of the real across worlds of living. So this was the perfect place for this piece. For me, you know, had, it was very meaningful. I could not go to install it. It had to be installed with me on the phone, WhatsApp with, the, with the, my team at the biennial and they would, they would even go to the flower market. Hanul would go to the flower market and say, do you want that flower? And I go, yes, that flower. But I'm here in bed in Toronto looking at the phone. <laughs> so it, going back to with the comment about 1900 mirror mirror, can you install this if you're not there? Can these be installed with me not being there? Yes, they can be installed with me not being there. So, but I'm happier when I'm there. Um, so, so it, um, it's become very, this has been a wonderful experience, even though I wasn't able to travel there. And we also did a Zoom with uh, Jetsima Tenzin Pomo, who is a very well-known nun. Oh, that's us doing the performance. So um, this is me with, this is the WhatsApp. So that's me when we did the blowing away of the mandala with the team from Guangzhou. And that's Stephanie Ayas, one of the directors of the Guangzhou Biennial, who's based in Berlin. And Daphne also uh, was the director of the Wit to Wit, which is now the Nelly, I believe, that uh, had the temptation of A.A. Ponson mm. many years ago. So it all like reconnects. So um, the, the importance of all these interconnections is, Wonderful, but I think uh, there's going to be a link to the video we did in the, yeah. So this is a link for anyone who wants to, you can look it up, the Guangzhou Biennial, my name. And at the end, it's my artist page. And at the end, there's uh, the Zoom talk we did with Jetsma Tenzin Pomo 
a well-known Buddhist nun based in the Himalayas who I've worked with for many years. Um, we have a nonprofit to help women with their spiritual practice. And she addresses many of the issues that I read about the, the project that the directors wrote. So it will be, you know, I think it's a very interesting video recording of the Zoom talk and people really like it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, I think that's a great place to, to um, maybe open it up um, for questions. If there are questions from the audience, um, I can look if people want to type in the Q&A or the chat. Um, Vicky. Uh, the declining hair. One of my friends is a Buddhist said when the flowers are there, is it the Dakini hair? It's a parable. You, you can take it to mean however you want. It's not specific. It's an allegory. Where does the hair come from? What? Where do you get the hair? Well, I've printed the hair for 30 years, wigs, wherever I get the hair. Wherever? Yeah. Okay. Nothing, it's no one specific here. <laughs> We're not going there. <laughs> Are there any other questions from the audience? Can they see me? Can we pull out of this? Yeah, let's stop this. Because I'd rather, yeah, that's good. Okay, and we'll go to... Um, I think we're probably on gallery view for everyone. Um, I only see you, so. Yeah, I only see you. <laughs> um, but people can write in the chat, I guess. Sure. Or I can just pull it the candy card. Yeah, let's do that. Let's pull a card. Um, I already pulled a card. Oh, you did. <laughs> okay, you pulled a card. What? What is? What was the premise of the the card pull? What were you wanting to know, or what did you ask? Pardon? What were you wanting to know, or what did you ask when you pulled the card? I didn't ask anything. Okay. I'm. I i do not ask anything. You don't ask anything. This is no. just what the universe wants to tell. I mean, not 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 to using Rob Stick. Okay. I don't ask anything. Okay. You know. And you know, I have to say, using cards, it doesn't solve your life or do anything. It's just information in a way. Yeah. And you can take it and go off with it of many mean. And uh that's sort of how it can be, you know, challenged or evoked. It doesn't it's nothing getting a getting a psychic reading or a tarot reading ge generally will not change your life or change what you do. Yeah. I totally believe in free will, but it is information. It is a parable. It is a mythological information for you to build on however you want. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I do like getting readings, but it's information, but it's, even if it happens, what they say, it doesn't change how you would have done anything anyways, I don't think. Right. Do, does that make sense? Yep. I'm not trying to be negative. No, no, no. Uh, you have to work, you have to work with it. Yeah. So um, I pulled a hard card, which says as, as above, so below. And I sort of like this because I thought it fit with the mirrored room, with the infinities as above, so below. And um, I'll just read you what the, what the book says. Because when Rob and I would do this, he would read the whole text. So, and it's said here, a flowery mandala is depicted against a, against a background of mysterious mountains glowing in the morning light of a new day. In the world below, the raw energy of the earth is seen bursting forth from molten lava from a volcano. Above is a refined essence 
of consciousness suggested by the quality of light and the expansy of fresh air and space. The flower is as if projected on the mind sky from the clouds or the mountains, mirroring itself to produce the rich image of purple and red in the form of a mandala or mystic protective enclosure. In the two worlds of above and below, it mirrors itself to form a single unity. As has been attributed to Emerald Tablet of Hermes, the Supreme Alchemist, that which is above is as that which is below, and that which is below is as that which is above for performing miracles of the one thing. Thou shalt separate the earth from the fire, the subtle from the gross, and gently and with much care, it ascends from the earth to heaven and again descends to earth. So receiving the strength of both superior and inferior things, by this means you will have the glory of the world. Because of it all, obscurity will leave you. So it's a hard card and it's, it, it's indicative of the truth beyond all dualities. An investigation, letting go of duality, is one of the biggest things, tenets of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. That's so perfect. <laughs> I see Andy has a question. There's Andy has a question and um, Vicki has another question as well. Okay. So let's go to Andy first. Okay, so Andy says, I know you have worked in printmaking studios in New York and Toronto. Have you ever worked in an atelier in Athens? And how have the three very different cities influenced your work? Great question. I would love to find a press in Athens. That has not happened yet. But in our family house, I do make work and I, I can print by hand. Uh, in New York, I worked at the Lower East Side Print Shop, but currently when I'm there, I work at the Bob Black Burn, which is where the Elizabeth Foundation is. And they have a huge press there called Big Mama, which I love working on. And, uh, and here I work for a big press at Open Studio, but this past year during the pandemic, uh, a very dear friend gifted me a small press, which is in the basement. And I'm lucky because my friend Andine, Rob Flack, had these blocks from India that when he and Tim Guest went to India in the 80s. So she came over them with the other day and, and I'm going to be printing them, mostly by hand with the wood blocks, but I'm very excited about it. Um, Vicky was asking, what does ecofeminism mean to you? Well, I was, my friend Amy Lipton, who pa passed away in December, was part of uh, Eco Art Space. And she curated a number of shows on the environment. And so a lot of the women involved in the eco art world, which is, they're starting to get recognized more in the contemporary, regular art world. But they were sort of like in their own um, their own space. Uh, you know, the art world has many different groups, and the eco artists they do ecoventions, and they really aren't. A lot of the work they do isn't really uh, dependent on the art market. Mm -hmm. It's you know, a lot of them are professors at universities. Uh, they do very like large public works uh, trying to reclaim the land holistically and a lot of them are women mm -hmm. so it's it's a feminist action to reclaim the earth and be environmentally conscious as an artist i think i think it sort of is easy to understand feminism eco mm -hmm. Thanks, Vicki. Um, Jacob has a question in the Q&A section. He says, Chrisanne, in your installation for the Guanju Biennial, you included a pitha, pitha? which um, 
is also an object that appeared in the performance you presented in Athens as part of Documenta 14. Uh, you and Rhiannon have talked about some of the reoccurring images and motifs in your work, but I was wondering if you could talk about the role of the Pythia in multiple projects. The Pythia is, is, it can be stated two ways, the Oracle of Delphi, but she also would get the vapors from possibly the hallucinogenic drugs from a tripod. So at the same time in my work, sometimes I embody the, P the Pythia, but I also call the Pythia the tripod, which is in the center of it. So if, if I had been in Korea, we might've done a ritual inside the Pythia, but because it was at the National Museum, I couldn't really burn things. So, so, but, you know, that's, we play around with it. I have a great image of a coin of, a, of the image of the tripod and then a snake and then of Hermes, you know, yes. so with a bow and arrow or mercury. But Andy has a longer explanation for it. I, I find it very, um, I, the, the way that you are able to intertwine different mythologies from different cultures in your work, I find yeah. it done in a very, in a very elegant and um, a genuine way of, of bringing ideas from, from Greece, from India, from Canada, um it all together well, well we're we're all interdependent it's as if the you know some people think the mandala is just like just based in asia but if you go to the archaeological museum in athens and you see these tile floors of the mandala surrounding a gorgon or a medusa you know you you know that those those constructs those have been around and shared by cultures all over. We're, we're interdependent. It's like the virus. You know, we can't say we're not. You know, we're interconnected, we're interdependent. And maybe sometimes we can be alone in a little spot or in a cave, but it doesn't mean, especially now, we're very interdependent. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the horrific things of the past few weeks with the virus and with wars, in Israel and Palestine are really tragic. And, you know, one hopes that things change. What is very interesting now is the interest in the Greek plays and the Greek mythology. Because what, what I've seen in the past few years is an opening up of many contemporary artists, many theater companies relooking whether it's the plays of Euripides or the idea of Medusa or the construct of Dionysus, you know, sort of have this, this deep connection that of, of the meaningful myths that still relate very deeply. I jokingly said to one of the directors, I said, you know, because some of the Greek artists have said, especially with the interest in um, the Greek statuary and stuff that they're copying our, our history. And I said, well, you know, there's no live religion for that. You know, the, in Greece right now, the religion is the Greek Orthodox, but it isn't the religion of Dionysus and Athena. So it's sort of, because there's no heavy duty religion, it opens up the whole door for everybody to participate in. Mm -hmm. Because there's no conservative, conservative religion, you know, people saying this is better, this is better, because it's a, it's beyond that. Mm -hmm. It opens up for everyone to be in some connection to the mythology, yeah. this, and especially the psychology mm -hmm. of the of the ancients. I'm not saying they were perfect. I'm just saying by any means. Mm. Uh, 
Um, well, I don't see, I don't see any more questions. Um, and we're after two, so maybe if there aren't any other questions or comments, um, I will say many thanks to Black Flash for hosting this. Many thanks to Chrisanne for joining us. Many thanks to all the participants who I can see over here um, who have um, listened to our discussion and our conversation. And um, I would definitely encourage okay. everyone if they haven't already to go online and get a copy of the, the latest issue of Black Flash to subscribe. Um, it makes a big difference, the number of, of regular subscribers that a magazine like this has, especially um, in Canada right now. Um, okay. I wanted to say thank you to everyone. I'm, my computer broke, so I'm on my iPhone, so I can't see anybody or what they did anything so anyways thank you for joining thank you everyone um and i hope it's as sunny and warm where you are as it is here in toronto thank yeah. you thank you